Hey, Jerry, how's it going? Hi, David. How's it going? Very it's all good, going good. Good, good. Great to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um, Great to be here. As, as part of the in intro, everyone's familiar about your stellar career that you've had spanning all sorts of phenomenal brands uh, during your time in SEO. Um, just be great if you could look back at some of that and maybe pick out some of the highlights that stand out in your mind. Mm, uh, sure. Uh, long story short, did a bit of time with the government, which was working on on-site search um, and sort of various kind of uh, campaigns and bits and pieces working for people like DirectGov, which no one remembers anymore, but it was the predecessor to UKGov. Um, Joined companies like the BBC, Razorfish, and then Just Eat is kind of the more famous one. Um, joined a Norwegian supermarket for a little bit of time. And finally, I'm working kind of building a SaaS company called Mirador Local at the moment. So, yep, the last, I hate to say it, probably 25 years. Every time I kind of do an interview, it seems to have gone up by a year or so. But, yeah, 25 years. Never nearly. stands still. But, uh, mm. look, I mean, J Just Eat, what a phenomenal brand. I'd say it's relatively rare that someone in freelance would get to work on such a big brand. How did you go about landing that gig? Yeah, so um, combination of things. A, basically, I was already doing quite a little bit of sort of freelance work at the time. And somebody basically came over to me and says, oh, you know, they're looking for a consultant for three months. And I kind of said, yep, that sounds great. Three months sounds perfect. It was kind of full-time contracting consultant. And I thought that was a great kind of opportunity for me to learn about a company and do bits and pieces. I thought it was a very small role initially, but then three months later it carried on and it was another three months and another three months. And, you know, it just rolled on for uh, two or three years nearly, actually. It was it was a couple of years, well, in fact, it was four years actually at the end of it. It was it was quite a long time, basically. But yeah, eventually they made me permanent for a couple of while because they couldn't keep employing freelancers for longer than two years. So that's why it kind of had to go to permanent for a little bit of time, but absolutely brilliant opportunity. And yeah, I think it was one of the, the most uh, enjoyable jobs I've ever had. And what a fast paced growth story they've had as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When I left them, they'd just been kind of uh, merging with takeaway.com. So they went from half the world to nearly all of the world. And part of me would love to have stayed and carried on doing bits and pieces, but it did feel a bit like no one was quite sure what was happening. And I got the opportunity to join a agency and do some fun stuff there for uh, about a year. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, your, your time at Just Eat is probably a nice segue uh, into what we're going to focus on today, which I know a lot of your work now is is really solely focused on local SEO. Mm. Um, I would assume that the, nearly everybody listening uh, is going to be familiar with what local SEO is, but perhaps um, for anyone who's not, maybe you could set the scene and, and some of the ranking factors that are super important now. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things where for every company it's a little bit different. The reason I say that is that, you know, for some people it's it's such a local experience. But I mean, one brand that we worked with quite a lot when I was there was KFC. And one of the fun things was experiencing that um, when I searched for it, uh, Just Eat was number one for various kind of key terms are related to like Just Eat, uh, sorry, KFC Takeaway and other bits and pieces. But if somebody in Brighton searched for it, then it would be a different experience. Local, I mean, Google have basically said that like 90% of search results, or I've come over the, the number actually off the top of my head, I should know this, but basically a huge number of search results have got kind of a local intent. So if I search for something like a ramen or if I search for anything, the results for me are going to be very different to the, the results for somebody, you know, even 10, 20 miles away. Google knows so much about you and where you are. And it's just kind of understanding that all of the results are kind of different. Um, this basically means that you've got to make sure that your your kind of search results, your 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 uh, what's the word for it, website, your your kind of content, everything is relevant to why somebody should be finding you in your particular area. So, a good example is the fact that I currently live in Red Hill, and so you know if I'm searching for a chemist, then a chemist in Red Hill will come up. And my favourite search result for some reason is ramen, and you know every time I do a search for ramen. It'll be like six different restaurants. It'll also come up with some recipes and other bits and pieces. But, you know, a core factor of the search results is always kind of local. And I think it's important to note that, you know, if, if you are trying to rank consistently for everybody, local will play a key part to it. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's, it's amazing, actually, how many search results Google does feel are relevant for a local kind of listing. And in the past, in my career, mm. I've had... I've worked for a software company, a B2B software company, which in, in, in all honesty ought to have absolutely nothing to do with the locality of where somebody is searching from. 
other other than maybe at country level and even then depending on where you were searching from you'd get either this particular company that i was working for or maybe some of its competitors if you were searching elsewhere um and another one of my clients currently they're a they're a video production agency um mm. and they're not they're not interested in producing things like wedding and bar mitzvah videos um they produce things like you know animated 3d explainer videos or corporate uh interviews so again it shouldn't it sh it, it's the sort of search term that i personally wouldn't expect to be uh necessarily restricted in terms of relevance to a local area but absolutely all of them tend to be it's a set of local listings for them yeah um, and your your point about making sure about the relevance as well it's so I had a mini heart attack the other week because I did a check over the weekend. I can't help, but I'm a bit of a worker, workaholic. Um, mm. and I did a bit of a check for how this particular organization was ranking. And of course, being a B2B business, they work pretty standard office hours. So Monday to Friday, nine till 5.30. Um, and conducting that search on a Saturday morning when they're closed and Google knows that they're going to be closed because you've got that information on their, on their listing in um, Google business profile. Um, it ranked them, I can't even remember what it was, but they'd gone from being like position one or two to basically invisible. But then yes. by Monday, they were back, back again. So yep. fascinating. Opening hours seems to be a big, big uh, sort of signal at the moment. And, you know, if you're open at the right time of somebody searching, you're, you're far more likely to rank in that sort of number one slot. I mean, another good example is when I was working for a Norwegian supermarket, you know, we kind of have this classic CTR curve. We kind of expect number one to get something like 80%. 60%, 30% of the clicks. As you go down, it kind of drops right down really quickly. But what's interesting is if the map pack is above you and you're still at number one, you can get a tiny proportion of the clicks. And that was something that when I was working for a Norwegian supermarket, you're going to ask me what Norwegian for supermarket is, and I can't remember for the life of me, even though it was only a year or so ago. Um, we ranked number one for a lot of terms. And I remember when an agency sort of came in, we had a conversation with them and they basically said, you know, ranking number one will get you this many clicks. And I kind of fired up Google Search Console and went, no, it doesn't. It's one of those kind of conversations that we all expect to kind of have been in a certain, you know, statistically consistent way, but we know full well it just doesn't now. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned about the supermarket as well, because I think, a, um, I guess an observation is that a lot of people think that local SEO is really only relevant to very small local businesses like your I don't know, lo local takeaway or maybe a window cleaning business or, or something like that. But actually, it really is relevant to much larger, much larger organizations and not just yeah. consumer facing either. No, it just seems strange how often I've looked at kind of major websites and they don't seem to kind of have landing pages for their key stores. It's almost like they've got one list of stores and no kind of particular pages for each. So if I search for, I'm, I'm trying to have a good example, but basically a particular store in a particular location, it's amazing how often that just doesn't even rank. Google hasn't even seen the, the landing page for it or a landing page for it. So of course, you know, it means that it's twice as likely to not, sorry, it's, it's far less likely to rank than you would really expect it to. So, you know, building out these core landing pages is such a simple task in, in theory, and it makes such an impact, but uh, I've, I've kind of experienced it myself. I mean. When I was at Just Eat, um, one of the biggest competitors, I won't mention who they are, but it begins with D. One of the things that I kind of noticed was their internal linking to their landing pages for their city areas was terrible. And it seemed like to kind of get to any of these pages, you need to type in a postcode. Whereas we had kind of a good link architecture. I remember basically speaking to, um, to kind of like the, the team, basically the marketing team and said, you know, at the moment we're doing quite well because they're doing quite badly rather than the other way around. I didn't want to sort of say I was doing a bad job. I just wanted to raise the risk. So it is very interesting, that example you gave with Just Eat then. So um, presumably it is possible for third party um, companies that sit in between the, uh, the the supplier business and the person conducting the search to actually outrank them uh, on local search terms as long as they are set up appropriately. Yeah, I mean, KFC is the example I used before. We would never rank number one for KFC, but we would often rank number one for KFC takeaway, KFC delivery, KFC, um, to be honest, I've run out of kind of expressions, but basically those kind of key terms, basically, or KFC in X, Y, Z. You know. So it is important that you kind of, it's about that keyword research and understanding uh, consumer intent. So if my intent basically is to order something online and get it delivered to me, then it might not be that the main website is the right place. We've seen this many, many times with 
fashion brands and similar kind of companies where, you know, if you search for a particular brand, you know, Tesco's or, or Waitrose or Amazon, I mean, Amazon is the one that we all love and hate, but, you know, as a consumer, we love it. As a SEO guy, it, it's kind of frustrating that they're often like two positions ahead of you, even on your own search brands. And it's just something where you kind of go like, how is it that Amazon are just so dominant? But it's because, you know, we understand this kind of intent that when I want to buy something straight away, Amazon fulfill that. And the fact that a lot of the time our own websites, it's almost like it's a flag waving site to say, now go buy it somewhere else. So it just doesn't work as a user kind of journey. Hmm. Yeah. And you touched earlier on some of the, well, I suppose really the, the importance of making sure that you are relevant for the intent of the search as, as signals to, I mean, let's just be honest about it. It is nearly always Google when we're talking about SEO at the moment. Um, it's mm -hmm. what, what signals are there that Google are going to be picking up that will give you a, a sort of outsized return on your effort, um, for making sure that you are appearing for those relevant terms. As you sort of mentioned before, basically it's, it's that, uh, map pack side of it, which is always right at the top of the page. And even if it's not the map pack, Google's using that information to basically make sure the right kind of businesses are ranked in the right places. So, you know, make sure your Google. I still want to call it Google My Business, but it's now called Google Business Profile. Google keep renaming everything, which is frustrating because I actually wrote a book a couple of years back on Google Data Studio, which no one's ever going to buy because it's now called Google Looker Studio. But going back to the point, I I think that they've renamed uh, Google My Business or Google Business Places about four or five times relatively recently. At one point, it, they had it with kind of Google Plus Local or something similar to that. And of course, that died. But basically, they've just renamed it GBP, which as a British person means that, you know, when we search for GBP, hmm. our great British pounds comes up. So, you know, it's, I'm sort of going off on a bit of a rant here. But basically, um, yeah, make sure your uh, your listings are up to date and perfect. It's amazing how often I've kind of done a search for a company or done a search for something. And it says things like the hours might be wrong or this business might be closed or something similar. And, you know, I will never trust that business if I kind of don't believe it's going to be open. I might actually call them up or do something, but I'm not as likely to kind of go visit them if I don't believe that the opening hours are correct and similar. So, you know, making sure all this information is correct. The other side of it is reviews. We kind of do spot that nine times out of 10, the, the top results have got the good reviews. And even if they don't, the amount of times that I kind of switch into the maps and then kind of filter it to being the top reviewed one. So, if I want to kind of find a local business, I, that review information is so, so critical. And it's surprising how often, you know, you look at it and they've got a few bad reviews and they've never replied to them. They've not even looked at them to kind of look at why or what's happened. So replying to the bad reviews is so important. In fact, replying to all reviews is important. But if you reply to the bad reviews, it means you can kind of make sure that, you know, you sort of share your side of the story. If, if they've kind of said something like the, I don't know, I ordered a coffee and the coffee was cold. You know, you can explain why or do something like that, but yeah. So yeah, totally the map pack. The other side of it is local relevance. And this is on page and off page. So make sure you've got a good landing page. And if you've kind of done anything of the local community sponsorship or something like that, then, you know, highlighting that is always a good thing. You know, Google takes their signals from so many different places and off pages is as much of a relevant signal as on page. So it's not just about saying, you know, you've got a, a store in, I'm trying to think of a town, Burton-on-Trent, um, having kind of pages linked to it and other companies talking about your store in Burton-on-Trent really boosts you up when people are searching for it. So there's so many different factors and, and off page, on page, internal linking, making sure the right place is there. And again, one of the sort of fun things is I live in a place called Earlswood and Nobody's ever heard of or, or knows it, but it's just outside of Red Hill. So if I kind of created a doctor's um, in Earlswood, I would probably name it sort of Earlswood next to Red Hill or something similar to that. So make sure like, you know, the local big town is literally there. So it's making sure that all other kind of key information, how people search for things is there. This is so important in London because, you know, London is a place where every single part of London is called slightly different by everybody who lives within that part of London. So, yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. I want to come back to reviews in a moment, but just for, for mm. the time being, just want to pull up, pull up that thread of uh, relevance and signals that we might be sending Google that perhaps you know, we, we may, may be unaware of. Um, we touched on um, Google's responsiveness to things like opening hours. 
Do you have any evidence or even just a gut feel for the importance of keeping that profile information accurate and up to date? So, for example, a local business might be expected to close down over Christmas and Boxing Day, but it might forget to update that information. In doing so, is that going to be negatively perceived by Google as opposed to just the end users who might look and go, oh, actually, I don't trust what you're saying anymore? Yeah, the, it's that kind of end user part of it that is all important. I mean, if a, if a user goes along and basically reports the hours as being incorrect, that kind of flags it up to Google. And if lots of people do it, then Google's kind of knowing that this information's incorrect. So it happens like that, basically, that Google looks at all of these kind of different sources of information and goes, actually, we don't think these hours are correct. We don't think this is um, up to date. And, you know, special hours is something you can enter into your Google business location quite easily. Um, I mean, we've got a tool to do it at bulk, but you can do it on an individual basis, which means that, you know, you literally go one by one and say, actually, for this particular bank holiday, or if you've got some extra opening hours for maybe Valentine's Day or something which is coming up, basically any opportunity you've got to kind of make sure your information is a little bit more correct is 100% worth it. And I strongly recommend doing it because of that factor, you know, because Google will kind of try to prioritize businesses, it's sure are open at the right time. And we've seen this quite a few times where businesses that are closed, well, you mentioned it yourself, businesses that are closed tend to kind of drop out or, or drop down. And when I do a search for a local thing, you know, especially when I use Google Maps, it, if it's kind of a, a relevant to now type search. So if I'm looking for coffee shop for now, you know, and if it's six o'clock and all of them are closed at five o'clock, it will prioritize the ones that are open for me. So yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. And then going back to reviews, um, completely understand the importance of them almost from a conversion mm. rate optimization perspective when it comes yeah. to getting people to actually see and trust and want to contact your business by having a lot of positive reviews and even if they're not actually showing that someone's there responding to them getting their, their side of the story across is there an element actually of the reviews themselves the content of the reviews containing keywords increases the relevance of a particular listing or is that not the case for, for local it does work a lot, actually. And I think the evidence of this is if you ever search for something, I mean, I, I chose the word ramen earlier on. Even if a restaurant man, doesn't mention the fact that they sell ramen on their, their business listing or they don't mention it anywhere else, if it's mentioned positively in the reviews, it'll come up, especially if they kind of talk about it, like I say, positively, it kind of really does boost up. Um, I mean, I've, I've often searched for like things like breakfast and stuff, and it will come up really highly if a lot of people mention the breakfast. You'll actually see some black text which says Google says a lot of people talk about the breakfast in this particular cafe or something similar. So, yeah, the reviews content, really, really good. Yeah. And it, it feels to me, um, with from what I've seen at least, um, that for local listings, probably more so than the generic national uh, searches, it's probably not the correct term, but there's a non-local SEO, that yeah. actually the content is of greater importance for the ranking of those profiles. And the reason I say that is I've, I've definitely seen examples of profiles that are outranking others that have I mean, the, 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 the ones that are in position one in the, in the local pack, in the map pack, will have uh, you know, one maybe review, often it's zero. Um, the content of the, the, the listing is quite poor. There's no imagery. It's just sort of shot from their Google Street View car of the business, that sort of thing. And then there's competitors of theirs with really strong domain authority, loads and loads of relevant backlinks, but they've named themselves something that's a bit more generic. So it's a very much strong brand name search, mm. whereas they're being outranked by somebody with, on the face of it, a, a poorer quality profile, but they just happen to mention, I don't know, chicken takeaway, Ilford. Is, and that's their business name, and it then seems to increase the, massively in an outsized way the, the relevance to uh, that particular local search. I don't know if you've seen the same. Yeah, we've seen a lot of similar bits and pieces where, you know, an exact match domain or an exact match kind of search will often ridiculously outrank where it should be at. I've got an example where a brand actually, I'm, I'm not going to mention it, but I did used to work on it in my last agency. And they closed down. And if you search for their brand now, it's it's weird that um, despite the fact that Next bought them and everything's redirected, this random no-name company that does drop shipping comes up. And I'm looking at this kind of going, this shouldn't be up to rank. There's absolutely no way this this brand with no backlinks, with no actual physical location on the pages, with nothing on it. But for some reason, Google's kind of gone, oh, this is the brand that's associated with this search term. 
And despite the fact that, you know, the brand is, is definitely not connected to it anymore, it's, it's managed to kind of come at number ones, number twos for a lot of key product terms. And I think the same thing with local basically is like, you know, if it's amazing how many taxi companies, for instance, don't have the word taxi in their results, they, for some reason, want to kind of make themselves look a bit more premium. So when I'm searching for taxi, my eyes naturally are drawn to the ones that say taxi and, you know, the results will tend to kind of come up with the ones that have taxi in the brand name. So yeah, it is important to kind of make sure you've got the actual products as much as you can within the, the listings, the information and the, and the actual domain and other bits and pieces, because otherwise it will, you will might find that, you know, you're losing against it. That said, I have seen a hilarious kind of meme going around that somebody decided to call their restaurant, um, curry near me. And, uh, I think that's a great restaurant name, but I don't think that works anymore. That said, I, I don't know. I, I, I wonder how much that traffic that restaurant actually gets. Yeah, they're number one everywhere. That's brilliant. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. So um, just going back to reviews, and we, we've already covered the importance of them. Um, have you got a process in mind or that you might advise people take for getting reviews so that they, they happen at scale rather than just at random? Yeah, I think you kind of do have to kind of ask for them. You have to suggest and, and positively encourage them to be left. I mean, part of the problem is the fact that there's a lot of keyboard warriors out there. They're the people who, you know, their coffee comes out and it's the wrong type of sugar. It's brown sugar instead of white sugar or something. I don't just leave a one-star review because they're just really angry about it. And there's a lot of people out there who you give them a little bit of a bad service, you spill a cup of tea, do something, and, you know, they immediately will not give you kind of a, a, a good review. That said, if you ask people to kind of leave review, they're twice as likely to kind of give you a positive review. So I see that a lot of the businesses out there with positive reviews, you can kind of see the fact that they've clearly suggested or clearly encouraged people to leave a review for them. You're not in, you're not doing anything like paying them or you're not doing anything to kind of incentivize the reviews. You're just kind of basically suggesting, almost asking for them to leave a positive review. And it kind of counteracts all of the negative reviews that just the the kind of the random people who are angry about everything will leave. I mean, one of the fun things is when I've been looking into the, the kind of the reviews for a lot of our clients and, and how they're sort of set up and other bits and pieces, the people that leave a lot of one and two star reviews have after, often left a lot of bad reviews for other companies out there. I mean, I have to be honest, if I ever leave a one star review, I try to leave at least three or four, five star reviews for other companies out there. Cause I've always uh, have a little bit of guilt kind of thing, but, um, I Balance do still feel like, universe. you know, I, yeah. I still feel like I want to make sure that everybody else kind of knows if it's a, not a good experience. So, you know, state agents, um, whoever it is basically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically get, encourage people to leave a review. The other thing is it's also worth remembering that there's more than just one place to leave a review. Um, in fact, an internal conversation, basically we've been talking about the fact that how do we encourage people to leave reviews everywhere? There's one of the things that we spotted is a company can have like a 4.6 on Google but a 1.2 on another service. Um, and it is interesting that we're seeing like these reviews that are so completely diametric and the way in which the reviews are calculated and distributed and other bits and pieces, some reviews, some review sort of tools, um, only kind of count the last six months of reviews and X number of reviews and other bits and pieces. Some of them, it goes back a lot longer. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of important to kind of maintain this flow of good reviews to different, uh, sort of different, um, services. I mean, we all kind of check TripAdvisor before we kind of go and book in a hotel, or at least I do now. I've learned my lesson. But basically, you know, we all kind of check these places. And these reviews are being brought into Google search results. They're being brought into Google's own kind of algorithm to check how good a quality a place is. We would see Just Eat reviews, for instance, being pulled into Google search results, um, not just for the, not just in the SERPs with like that kind of like golden triangle, golden stars that you see in the, the underneath the, the listings, but also in the, the sort of the knowledge panel part of it for each restaurant. So Google was actively pulling in just its own reviews because it trusted them so well. So if Google trusts the source, it will pull them into its own kind of algorithm, its own kind of displaying of the knowledge panel. Oh, that's fascinating. I hadn't realized that Google did that. I, I had assumed that they uh, were trying not to rely on third party sites for that sort of information. And that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, just. Just thinking um, then ahead to, well, in, in terms of uh, Mirador, so you, let's, let's imagine a scenario, you get a, a new client looking to, uh, well, they're working with you, they want to improve their local SEO. 
where would you advise they start? I think that's exactly it. Reviews is always a good place. I mean, one of the things I'd do is, is I would sort of suggest that they do a comprehensive kind of top level audit. If they've got a hundred locations, check daft things like the, the image that comes up. I mean, one of my favorite kind of examples, it's not a customer of ours at all, but Baskin Robbins and Crawley, if you search for it, it comes up with a underpass. And I look at this kind of picture of the underpass and it's like, well, I don't want to go have a milkshake there. Definitely not going to buy some cookies from there. But actually it's because for some reason it's taken a street view image from outside. And I look at this street view image and it's completely different to the store that's inside. So, you know, it's a 10 minute job for them to kind of create, upload a logo, upload a couple of photographs, get the lighting right. It can even be a bad iPhone for iPhone photos are actually pretty good. But you know, I mean, bad camera phone kind of photo. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better than the underpass image to start with. So go through that. Basically, you can look at all of the different images that get pulled into it. Um, we have a tool basically at Mirador Local, which allows us to kind of pull out the main image for all of them. So we kind of dump that into a spreadsheet and we can look at it for all of the images across hundreds of them. And, you know, it's, it's that's a kind of first start. Second part, as you mentioned, is opening hours, just making sure that none of them are flagged up as being wanting to be to, to Google su suggesting changes. We call it Google suggested changes, basically, where Google said, oh, you know, this is what we think it should be. Um, do you want to accept or, or reject them? So what we'd recommend doing is making sure all of those are kind of re um, accepted where they're correct or rejected where they're wrong and making sure that that kind of is up to date. And of course, as you mentioned, like reviews, basically having a look at the number of views that you've got, going back to some of the bad reviews, making sure that they're kind of replied to correctly. And of course, making sure that like all of that kind of key information is all done. The other thing that people don't take advantage of is posts, which is interesting. I don't know if you've come across it, but basically in a Google business profile, you can add in a post and it's quite easy. Basically, if you've got a special offer, or if you've got an in-store sale or something, you can just kind of create it as a post. It's a relatively simple task. You create a post, you post it, and anybody searching for a particular thing will see this often as a big label, which says, you know, there's a special offer here. It will have the codes or anything else that you want to kind of go through to it. And you can do this at scale, kind of so you can do it to all your different stores. And, you know, if you've got an e-commerce or a fashion store or something and you've got some in-store offer, it's a great quick win. And I don't understand why more people aren't doing these things. I mean, we've not seen very many businesses taking advantage of all the opportunities in that that space. And then finally, as you mentioned, the reviews. Um, I saw something really cool on Etsy, actually, a couple of days ago. I was looking for something completely different. But Etsy had these kind of little plastic... QR codes where you can just kind of say from for the store, scan this or NFC and tap this and it will kind of go to leave a review. I think that's a great idea. I've kind of suggested it to the developers that we need to figure out how to kind of have uh, the ability to connect to a printer to kind of print these off to distribute out to the stores. Um, so that's quite a fun challenge, but that's that's down the line. They've kind of keep telling me that I can't keep putting more things into the pipeline for a week or two. It's such a nice touch though, isn't it? Building that process to gather things like reviews or keeping your content up to date because yes, you might have some internal champion who's just a wizard and, and is really diligent with keeping that information up to date, but eventually they'll be sick or they'll go away on holiday or they'll move jobs or, or whatever it is. Um, I've seen examples of um, companies where they've, they've got a really decent profile in place and a lot of it is manual, but mm. they are actively seeking reviews not just from their customers, but from other stakeholders as well. And I think that's absolutely valid. It might not be how most people uh, intuitively interpret who the reviews are being left by, but it's yeah. absolutely relevant for a supplier to say actually what it was like working with you. Did you pay on yeah. time, for example? If yeah. you've got a particularly good relationship with a partner or supplier, make the most of it. I agree completely on that one. I mean, it's surprising how often, you know, you kind of go and look at the reviews and you kind of go, oh, that's interesting. Like you mentioned the videographer customer, you know, it's, it's basically it'd be clients and people that they work with, the actors and all of those different people. There's lots of different opportunities for people who work with a brand to kind of leave a review or a pos positive review or a bad review. You know, I, I've seen people leaving reviews for companies saying, don't touch them. You know, it's, it's, they don't pay kind of contractors or something like that. So, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of opportunities for people to leave bad reviews. So. You know, at the same time, there's a lot of opportunities for you to kind of encourage people to leave a good review if you've had a positive experience with them. I mean, a lot of places, you know, they, they're not kind of open to the public in the same way you'd expect. So, you know, it's people that visit them and, and want to kind of go, actually, the, the offices are really lovely to work in. Good example of that, for instance, is Just Eat, the head office. 
you know, a lot of people would basically say about the fact that the offices were great, spacious, great environment, everything. So, you know, I quite, I did appreciate the fact that, you know, the, the office before I turned up there actually was a good place to work. Yeah, absolutely. I think everything that you've mentioned, I think that the way that I've managed to organize it in my head is, is actually, it is all about making sure that the, the user, the searcher gets the relevant information and has a good experience interacting with your profile. And it, I, I think that's quite a nice way of capturing everything there, because if we were thinking back to the point about making sure that the name is relevant, you gave an example of taxi companies, not including the name taxi mm. in their, in their name. Well, that probably impacts the click through rate as it does with having an image of an underpass for a coffee shop, that's going to impact the click-through rate as it would for you know, the click-through rate. If you've got loads of unresponded to one and two star reviews associated with your business mm -hmm. and surely yeah. Google are going to be taking that kind of interaction into account. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you are a business and you've got a lot of reviews, just upvote the ones that are positive. I mean, it's a really quick win, basically get a couple of people to upvote the positive ones and they'll come up before the unhelpful ones, the, the ones that kind of describe the bad experience and, you know, and it's, it's amazing what I've seen some of the reviews that are bad for. I mean, I, my, there's a, there's one of the strange things is there's a, a an aquatic shop that's got hundreds of kind of locations around. And I remember kind of an internal conversation when, when I basically said, you know, this aquatic space has got 500 store locations. And when I was looking into it a little bit, you know, one guy basically left a one star review and basically the comment was didn't visit. So, you know, it is kind of important that, you know, you kind of do bury these kind of bad reviews and you positively upvote the good reviews just to kind of get that positive experience going. Yeah. And Google aren't going to re remove anything regardless of how relevant it is, right? They will actually, if you complain or say something, we're seeing them being quite proactive recently. In fact, I saw a tweet from somebody quite recently and he basically was saying, you know, they are actually removing reviews that if there's a reason why they, they shouldn't be there. A good example is if they mention somebody's name or something like that. So if there's a reason they're violating Google's own terms and conditions, then they can be proactively removed. And you can get them reviewed, uh, removed quite easily by basically just saying, look, you know, reporting the reviews. So I would definitely be reporting reviews that are irrelevant or not relevant to the business at all. And if, if you don't believe that the review is fair, just report it. It's not something which you shouldn't do. I mean, I'm not saying please go around and re uh, report all of the, the kind of reviews you don't agree with because they said, you know, like a two star because, you know, the, the place was cold and drafty and the music was too loud. But if it's a two star and they basically complain about an irrelevant business, because I've seen that a few times where somebody's got the business wrong and, um, you know, we've all seen it basically. Somebody's got the wrong business. They're leaving bad reviews. I mean, I nearly did it myself. I, I left a review for a plumber after he kind of came and it was a good review i said to him oh you know i left a good review and he went no you actually left it for my competitor down the road there's two with a similar name and i kind of thought to myself, i wonder how many reviews for him are wrong and how many reviews for the other guy are wrong but you know i fixed it i gave but in fact i think i left the good review for the other guy up actually i felt bad taking it back down again but basically yeah you can kind of get reviews removed if they're for the wrong business or the wrong person or it's unhelpful or if it's just totally off topic so yeah definitely kind of look at getting the bad reviews removed. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and just briefly, could we touch on maybe the evolving role of AI in local SEO as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's kind of scary. I was just at a conference talks, uh, yesterday, something called search and stuff. It's great, uh, event thing. And I was joking about the fact that literally every talk, somebody has to mention local SEO. Um, I mean, there's so many opportunities. I mean, if you're creating a hundred different locations sort of pages and you want to kind of give it something a little bit extra, one of the things that I would do is I'd kind of put all the information into AI and just kind of spin out sort of a little bit of content for each one of them. You know, it, it, you can usually do it by just chucking in some keywords. When I say keywords, it doesn't have to be kind of SEO keywords, but kind of keywords relevant to it. So you're talking about, I mentioned before, the fact that people have different names for different places. So if your town is slightly outside of a main town, I'm trying to think of like a, a place um, that uh, would be relevant. But basically, if you've kind of got multiple names for your town, make sure they're all in it and you can then spit out some content and, you know, just talk about it. So AI is great for content. It's great for analysis. It's great for kind of replying to reviews. So if you've got a lot of reviews and you want to kind of hit a thank you for the great review, instead of having a hundred kind of things, which says thank you for the great review, 
you can literally just put something into kind of an AI thing, which says, you know, pause, give me a better response than thank you for the great review almost. And there's, there's lots of ways of doing this kind of thing. So AI is terrifyingly good at a lot of these kind of tasks. And I'm, every time I see somebody doing a talk on AI, I nearly always learn something. The image generation stuff is phenomenal as well. I mean, I write a lot of blog posts for, for uh, Mirador Local or, or some of us do. And if there isn't a relevant image, I'll kind of just chuck something into a image generator like Firefly or something. It kind of gives me a great image straight out the back. Yeah, it's incredible how quickly it's evolving and, and the quality of some of the imagery uh, and even video now that's able to be produced through AI is absolutely mind-blowing. I've not played yeah, with videos yet. Jerry, that's my next job. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Well, it's uh, it's it's worth a look. Um, and even, even things like um, podcast production as well. There's just examples of being able to put some pretty ropey, pretty tinny and echoey audio through um, Adobe have got a tool that's able to make mm -hmm. it sound really rich and warm pretty much at the click of a button. They've got an example on their site where you flick a switch and the, the audio just goes from pretty amateur to actually that's really quite, really good quality. Yeah. And it's it's instantaneous as well. But mm -hmm. Jerry, it's time to start thinking about wrapping this up. Um, before we go, uh, I'm asking everybody for one marketing book that you feel everyone should read uh, and what it's taught you. Ooh, um, oh, um, oh. There is a book which I recommend to uh, everyone. I'm literally uh, trying to remember the, the guy that's written it now. And it's basically How Minds Change by David uh, McHenry. The reason I recommend this one so much is it kind of explains why, as a marketer, our, our job basically is to convince somebody about something or convince somebody that a service or something is, is kind of important. But it's amazing how often, no matter how many times you say something to somebody, they kind of will be really obstinate. And it talks about things like cults. It talks about how people who believe the earth is flat, well, it's almost impossible to change their minds. People who believe in conspiracy theorists and things like that. And I think the same thing applies in our jobs, basically. We're trying to tell people that, you know, they're looking, they're, they've got a set of beliefs and trying to change their beliefs is nearly impossible. And this book basically explains how to do that in so many different examples and it explains why people have such strong opinions. I mean, there's a great bit which talks about the, the the infamous dress, which is why some people see it as blue and some people see it as gold and how everybody argued on the internet. And it explained that basically that's down to how we believe it looks based on our experiences. And it's, it's a fantastic book. So 100%, I've even bought it for half a dozen of my friends now already because it's just so good. So, you know, I'm probably going to send it to a load more people next Christmas. Yeah, there's a very small number of books that I've bought more than once, um, but that tells you something about the quality and, and, and how much I rate the content in there, how much I've learned from them. But look, Jerry, that has been absolutely brilliant. I've learned a lot from this conversation. I've really enjoyed catching up with you as well. Thank you for Fantastic. all of your insights. Um, if anyone wants to connect with you afterwards, how could they go about doing that? Where would they find you? Uh, best thing is Twitter or LinkedIn. Drop me a message on LinkedIn. Um, it, just Google White SEO. And if I don't come up, then I'm doing something wrong. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jerry. Great to see you. You too. Thank you for your time.